Hello, and welcome to the final online seminar in the Remixing the Classics series. My name is Erin Sullivan, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the network, which is exploring how digital technologies are being used to remake classic literature and drama. I want to start by thanking our funders, the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council, our partner, the Association of Adaptation Studies, my co-chair, Deborah Cartmill, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, and our project assistant, Beth Sherrick, who has been working behind the scenes to make sure that everything runs as smoothly as possible. Please also feel free as audience members to use the chat constructively and respectfully during this event. And in fact, you might start now by letting us know where in the world you're tuning in from. I'm in my office in Stratford-upon-Avon in England at the Shakespeare Institute, which is part of the University of Birmingham. Those of you who've been to previous events from Remixing the Classics will know that over the last few months, we've hosted a series of online seminars exploring what digital technologies bring artistically, pedagogically, politically to the retelling of old stories. We're really grateful to our speakers for allowing us to record the sessions, which we're making available on our project website as we go. And in a minute, I'll put the link, link into the chat, links for a few of the things I'll mention, including the project website. We're also hosting a hybrid workshop on the 15th of July, focused on cross-professional collaboration and knowledge exchange. It's going to take place in Birmingham in the UK, um, and it's going to focus a lot on networking and making connections in that region, but its talks will also be streamed online, and we have a really great program lined up that I think will be of interest to people internationally. Um, again, in a minute, I'll share a link that will allow you to look at more information about that workshop. Um, and finally, we're hosting an online conference about digital adaptations in August on the 9th. We're currently finalizing the program and we'll be sharing it on our website and on social media at the start of July. Um, so finally, if you'd like to know more about these uh, future events and recordings of past events, the easiest way to do so is probably to sign up for our network mailing list. And again, I'll share that link in just a second. Um, so I mentioned that we're hosting an online conference on digital adaptations in August, and also in relation with that, we're putting together a journal special issue on the topic. So I'm going to turn over now to my co-chair, Deborah Cartmel, to tell you a little bit more about that. Hello everyone, I'm Deborah Cartmel, and I'm the co lead on this project, and uh, I'm also the Associate Pro Vice Chancellor for Research um, at Democrat University in Leicester. I'm really excited about this seminar, but really sad, it's our very last one. It's hard to believe we've just gone by so quickly. Um, it's been often observed that on the whole, um, and with the exception of this extraordinary group of speakers, um, adaptation scholars have been rather slow to integrate practice um, in their research. And so this session is really most welcome. As Erin has said, there will be two more events, um, one on July the 15th and one on August the 9th, um, and details of which we'll be putting in the chat. Um, this, we'll be publishing a special issue of the journal Adaptation, um, published by Oxford University Press, which will draw um, papers from all the event, events we've had over the course of this project. And if you're not a contributor to any of the events, you can still submit an article for consideration. Um, and you can do this through our online portal. We also intend to edit a special issue on digital Shakespeare for the journal Shakespeare, which I also co-edit. Um, and again, submissions are most welcome in, in an area which is developing so rapidly um, and which is still sadly, I think, underrepresented in, in these two journals. So we very much look forward to hearing from all of you and to the speakers today. So back to Erin. Thanks very much, Deborah. So it's now my pleasure to turn our attention to today's seminar on mixed realities and intermedia, and to welcome our brilliant trio of speakers who have very generously agreed to share their expertise and time with us today. Over the last two years, the phrase, the future is hybrid has become a commonplace. Digital and in-person modes of interaction increasingly intertwine with all of us discovering new ways to connect both on screen and off. So in today's seminar, we want to ask what a hybrid future might mean for the creative arts, and especially for new works that respond to classic texts. We also want to explore how artists have been exploring, have been looking at these boundaries between so-called real life and online life, 
long before the pandemic, and in many cases, decades before. What kinds of adaptations of classic texts have they created? And how might they think, help us think through the hybridity of our own lives? As with our previous seminars, we'll begin with 10 minute presentations from each of our speakers, and then we'll use the second half of the seminar for discussion. We hope that you, the audience, will get involved. You can submit questions using the Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar, and you can also contribute comments and further thoughts in the chat. Deborah and I will keep an eye on the Q&A and chat comments, and we'll draw on them when we get to the discussion portion of the seminar. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Lucy Askew. Lucy is Chief Executive for Creation Theatre Company, based in Oxford in the UK, but performing globally through its prolific and innovative digital projects. Creation made international headlines in April 2020 when it reimagined its site-specific production of Shakespeare's The Tempest for lockdown audiences on Zoom. In her review of the production for The Guardian, Miriam Gillinson marveled how, even in the midst of the pandemic, Creation and its audiences were, quote, creating live theater together and making something that feels a little bit like magic. Since then, Lucy and her team at Creation have adapted a series of classic authors for online performances, including H.G. Wells, Lewis Carroll, The Brothers Grimm, and many more. And they've also developed a rich online drama program for students. Lucy's work with Creation has really pushed theater makers and audiences to think about innovation, sustainability, and inclusion in the performing arts. And we're very grateful to welcome him, her here with us today. So without any further ado, I'll invite the rest of the panelists to turn off their video other than Lucy, and uh, we'll turn over to her. Hello, and now I'm gonna do something that has got no less frightening for all the digital shows that we've done, and I'm gonna to attempt to share screen. Um, I've done it enough times now, you think it would, I'd be able to do it without the absolute horror and terror that somehow this is going to go wrong. And um, So I'm going to share a screen, and you should be looking at a screen that says Creation Theatre and has a logo on, so please do tell me if for any reason it's not showing that, and I'm going to move that little thing saying close the transcription box. And um, Does that look all right, Erin? Have I got the right thing yeah. showing? So far, Wonderful. So good. And now I'm going to turn the other screen, minimise you all so I can get to my... Uh, controls for PowerPoint. Um, so I'm Lucy, I'm the Chief Executive for Creation Theatre Company. We are traditionally uh, known, well, before the pandemic, we were primarily a site-specific theatre company known for doing adaptations of Shakespeare and classic texts. And um, so all over the place in car parks and parks and rooftops and industrial estates and bookshops and, and libraries. Um, we, like Erin said, we, we pivoted very rapidly at the start of the pandemic to working online and doing digital work. And since then, we've done 13 uh, online productions um, that really are, are specifically made for digital. So they're not productions where we're showing them to an, an in-person analogue audience and we're also streaming them or streaming some element of them. They are made for a live digital audience. Of them, I would say 11 of them fall very clearly into being adaptations of classics um, and of all of those given the freedom to just pick one to talk about I've chosen to talk about The Time Machine today which is which is a production that we we did in sort of early 2020 and then remounted as a digital production and um, so I was just going to a little bit about the the origin <laughs> origin story of why we chose to do H.G. Wells' The Time Machine um, and that really starts with uh, going back to Bram Stoker and they, we did a production of Dracula um, that started in Blackwell's Bookshop in Oxford. And the director of the London Library came to see this production and approached me afterwards and said, I run a library in London. Would you like to come and, and do a show here? And I turned up in London very much with the perceptions of it being like a council run library that I've been exposed to most of my life and thinking there'd be a children's section and some books in plastic covers. Um, only to discover the most extraordinary library I've ever been to in my life. So the London Library is a membership only um, library right in the centre of London, which has the most incredibly prestigious um, membership list. So it feels like nearly every author of the sort of uh, you know, 20th century was a member there. Um, so Bram Stoker 
uh, was a member of the London Library, which was why they were interested in having Dracula. It's an extraordinary building. And if you love books, it's worth, uh, if you've not been there booking, they do a free tour where you can go and have a look around. Um, it has these stacks with like iron grates that you can look through. And that whole section of the building is entirely held up by the books. They've sort of the weight of the books, the whole building shrunk by two inches. And if they ever take the books out, it's all gonna fall down. So we ended Dracula there. But Dracula was a static production, so this is a, um, one of our show photos from it. We were starting to work without consciously knowing we were moving into a digital world. We were starting to do something slightly more hybrid here. It had a lot of projection um, work in it. So it was a two person show and we used projection to create, you never saw Dracula, Dracula was always shadow and projection sort of playing on that fear of the unknown. Um, but after that, having seen this extraordinary uh, building, we were really keen to follow it up with something where we could really get our audiences immersed in this labyrinth of um, bookcases. Um, so when we were invited to come back the following year, um, we looked at this list of authors and we, we picked H.G. Wells and we pitched that we would like to do a production of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, where we could take small groups of audience and each audience would have their own time traveller, their own... Um, uh, time traveller who would then take them around the building and they would encounter um, some other live actors and sort of get the story would unfold as they moved around the building. Um, so this really moved us, here's one of our time travellers, uh, Rodri, who's also in The Tempest, um, in the stacks there. This really started to move us into a, into a more hybrid type of show. And um, we weren't using those words then, this was, <laughs> this was all new to us, it was, you know, in a way, we sort of thought we were doing digital, but now we know its potential. We were really just dabbling in it. But we used wireless headphones. We used computer screens. We had a large screen with a sort of life-size character you met at one point in. We used projection. Um, and for us, it was quite an exciting way to be able to do something where you can you can have small audience in venues you could never get enough you know we're not we're not sort of publicly funded organization so to get enough volume of audience through a show with small audience numbers is quite challenging but actually if you can multiply up your performers by having them live in some places and on screen in some places you can start to do some really interesting things so so time machine at the london library was essentially a hybrid performance and um, where it gets really interesting is that before we uh, had, had written the scripts, we were approached by the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities, and they said to us, we would like you to do a show that will raise public engagement with our areas of research. And the kind of research they do at the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities, there's no short way to say that, uh, is they do research into neuroscience, big data, genomics, uh, global connectedness. It's really all looking at kind of ethical challenges that may face humanity in the future. And so obviously we jumped at the opportunity because that's a really exciting um, proposition um, to tackle. So Jonathan Holloway, who wrote our adaptation, went to the Welcome Centre and met with several of the researchers for a day. He just had coffees all day with different researchers and they just told him about their research and their specialisms. And then he went away and he wrote the time machine for us. So it created this sort of version of the of the HG Wells story where there were elements of the book. There was the book became a sort of character in the show, um, but it was really taking HG Wells's end point where we're in the future and where the time traveller previously has sort of speculated on why society is split into this kind of underground and above ground, the Eloy and the, the Morlocks structure. We used their research to fill in the gaps in between those two points. Now, what was incredible about it and, you know, like the, the most bizarre experience for us was that a lot of their research at this point in 2019 was saying, you know, there will be a pandemic, a SARS-like pandemic, millions of people will die, it will be spread by air travel, there'll be a lot of politics around vaccine inequity, and the only country that will be relatively unscathed is New Zealand. So this is the play that we'd written, and this is the play that we were performing in early 2020. Um, and then, you know, coronavirus, COVID, the pandemic began to unfold, and we were sharing this story with audiences, which felt so prescient, and, and what, what was meant to be science fiction started to become fact. Um, in terms of our sort of other digital adaptations and adoption and, and real, our commitment to digital, this is a really, really pivotal um, sort of piece of the creation story. 
because for us, it gave us this insight into and these experts who we were talking to. So while other companies were sort of coming into the pandemic thinking, oh, no, we've got to close. Well, maybe we'll be able to do a show in four weeks. Maybe we'll be able to do a show in the summer. Maybe we'll be able to do a Christmas show. Things will get back to normal soon. We sort of had been tipped off and we knew this is going to take two years. This is going to take a long time. So we adopted digital work. We took all the incredible things that, that, that came out of the Tempest with Big Telly and, you know, with our co-production with them. We, we really grafted all those things and ran with them because we knew we were in it for a long haul. We knew this wasn't something that was going to go away quickly. So we did the production of The Tempest within three weeks of the first lockdown on Zoom and completely fell in love with it as a medium to connect with audiences in a different way and a new form of storytelling. And after that, the logical thing to do next was to, 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 to move the time machine onto Zoom. We had a little pause at first because we weren't sure it was too soon and whether people would be ready for it. And then the end, we felt like actually we, we, we wanted to share this sort of take on what was unfolding with more people. So I'm just going to show you a really uh, quick clip of the trailer for that time machine. What I need is to know what time must I go to in order to head off this disaster which is all around us. There was perhaps a window of opportunity around. 2022, that was maybe the last chance. stop sharing there so you can see my face for the last uh, little bits of uh, uh, talking about the time machine and what was so interesting for us was being able to take a show we'd made in a physical environment which in itself was quite hybrid and quite digital and quite immersive and and transfer that online and discover that it gave us new possibilities so the the zoom version of the show had more like multiple narratives so there was choice the audience could make choices at different places in it we split the audience at different places and they went into breakout rooms and experienced slightly different things there was a poll at the end of the show and you could choose you had you had the choice really of how the show ended so you could go for a more utopian hopeful end to the show or you could go for a much a much bleaker version of the show but we really found through that that it was particularly exciting to work on a story that is we were able to transpose it into a far more sci-fi future and we really went for the sort of spaceship style backgrounds and dystopian sort of doctor who feel to it and i think we sort of carried that thread through a lot of the work that often what we found exciting about our kind of work is being able to go we can we can worlds fantasy worlds that would be difficult to create in a in a sort of analog world we can we developing a new visual language for how we can do that online but also it was always written as this very direct address Jonathan when he wrote it said it's almost like a lecture it's part TED talk part theatrical experience and um, so actually that format when you are working digitally like we do and your performers they were from home in front of webcams with green party tablecloths taped up, you know, we were in full on lockdown. And um, when your performer's talking directly to a webcam, it's like every single person in the audience is getting their own individual um, performance. It's a one on one dynamic then. So that kind of direct address, that kind of really intimate um, a dialogue with an audience member is really heightened whereas having experienced at the library myself it was incredible to be in that space but actually in an audience of 20 you can be at the back and you can have other people in front of you so we found that that the move online really took the show into being a different thing they were both wonderful in their own ways but there were benefits and there were things we discovered in the digital version um, that we we couldn't possibly have foreseen when we were doing the one in the library and I've done more than 10 minutes now and I could keep talking but I will I will stop there so that I don't eat into any of the interesting uh, chat time at the end. Thank you. Wonderful thank you so much Lucy I can see we already have questions coming 
Um, and so we'll save the discussion for the end, but please do, if you have questions as you go, um, feel free to put them in the chat and in the Q&A and we'll collect them up for that. Um, wonderful. So our next speaker is Emma Cole. Emma is Senior Lecturer in Liberal Arts and Classics at the University of Bristol, where she researches experimental approaches to performing ancient tragedy today. She's the author of Post Dramatic Tragedies, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2019, um, which documents the central role classical drama and tragedy especially has played in the development of avant-garde theater. She's also the holder of a UKRI Innovation Fellowship, which she's using to explore the intersection of immersive experience and the classics. Through this research, Emma's worked with Punch Drunk Theatre Company on two projects. The first, Kibay Roy, used mobile phones to take audiences on a journey through the streets of London. And the most recent, The Burnt City, tells the story of the fall of Troy in Punch Drunk's new performance space in East London. In her published writing, Emma has talked about the synergy and unique partnership that can be found when ancient texts, and especially those that are incomplete and fragmented, come together with immersive forms of theater making. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this work and I'm very pleased to welcome Emma here to the seminar this evening. Thanks so much, Erin, and thanks to Erin and Deborah for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now. Here we go. Uh, and talk to you all a little bit about a couple of digitally inflected adaptations of ancient Greek literature. Uh, the first one Erin's just teased for us, uh, it's Punch Drunk's Kibayroi, and then the second one is a pandemic pivot that I was also involved in, but in a quite different way. So Punch Drunk's Kibayroi, and I've got a, a short clip which I'm going to play in the background while I'm speaking, uh, as Aaron mentioned, is a play that was based on a fragmentary text by the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus. The play uh, exists to us today in only three fragments, and the, the three fragments really tell us nothing at all about the narrative. Uh, but Punch Drunk were interested in what we know about the story, which is that the play involved Jason and the Argonauts. It was part of their early Argonautic voyage, and it involved them getting stuck at an island where they were initiated into a mystery religion. Uh, and I was brought on board to Punch Drunk's production in 2017 to act as the academic advisor and to give some added information about what this lost narrative might have involved, uh, which was going to assist them in turning these three fragments into a four to six hour performance, which took place on the streets of London for just two audience members at a time. So no, no, no small order to turn three fragments into a four to six hour performance. For the production, we used technology in a, a range of different ways. There were three core parts to the resulting performance. The first bit was an audio tour, which used mobile phones and headsets to take the two audience members on a trip around London. This culminated in the British Museum, and you can see uh, in the still on the slide here, uh, a sample to audience members uh, in the British Museum. At this point, the headsets were taken off the audience members and they were just left with the smartphone. And the performance transitioned into a kind of scavenger hunt experience before the final third of the production, which was a more traditional immersive theatrical performance. If you can use the word traditional to talk about immersive theatre. Over the three parts, the audience was tasked with completing a quest narrative and was required to follow customised real-time instructions, which were at first delivered by that audio headset, but then later delivered by text messages, as well as more analogue forms of communication like hand-delivered notes and books and leaflets retrieved from lockers and storage units. The audience participants were tracked using satellite navigation throughout the performance. For director Felix Barrett, the fundamental purpose of the project and also its use of technology specifically was to blur that liminal space between the imagined and the everyday world, which was joined by the narrative journey. Occasional audience interactions with planted actors in the street helped to achieve this goal and also made it difficult for spectators to tell who was a performer and who was a member of the public. So what was real and what was part of the fictive universe of the play. Overall, Kibayroi was for Punch Drunk an experiment with new ways of working, and it used technology to try and put the audience at the heart of the experience, and it cast the audience actually as Jason, so as the lead protagonist from The Lost Tragedy. 
The use of the digital helped enable a seamlessness as the audience was gradually immersed into this world and positioned as Jason. And it also helped facilitate the dynamism of the experience, enabling the immersion to last for that four to six hour period. So it's used here by Punch Drunk to push the company in a new direction, to facilitate innovation. And the idea was that this would then be teased out in later projects which they would work in which they would work with some other texts. Before I go on to my second case study, I just wanted to flag up that Punch Drunk also tried to do a digital inflected adaptation of a classic text in the same year for a pedagogical purpose, which was for their production, The Oracles, which was for Key Stage 2 students, and it was something that was aligned with the maths curricula. Uh, whilst I was involved with Kibero, I wasn't involved with the Oracle, so I, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I just wanted to flag up another way that the company were using technology. This production started with a game which students were encouraged to play in the classrooms, so their maths teachers would employ it on an iPad in the classrooms, and the game then turned into a real experience with, at the end, the students being invited to Punch Drunk's offices. As you can see in the photos here, when they entered the offices, they were given these lanterns, which were equipped with hidden positional tracking and operated as magic touch devices, which enabled the students to do things like open locked doors once they had successfully completed a maths based activity. The lanterns worked by sending a signal through the body, which then interacted with a sensor based installation. So it wasn't so much having to swipe something like a card onto a sensor, but it meant that the actual students, so the participants in this experience, themselves became the source of the magic. So again, we're seeing an, another way that the digital is becoming inflected in Punch Drunk's productions and their adaptations of ancient mythology and literature, uh, and that the kind of experiments that the company are doing, which are trying to put the audience at the heart of the experience and as the protagonist of a performance. But to return to my primary case studies, I wanted to introduce you to one further work, which is The Gentlest Work, an adaptation of the Orestes story from Greek literature. Whilst Punch Drunk's Cabeiroi took a really unknown fragmentary story, this production involved perhaps the, the most widely known example of Greek tragedy, uh, which is the story of the House of Atreus, uh, told in Aeschylus' Oresteia, uh, our two Electra plays, and also the play Orestes. By Jove's mission, uh, who were the creators behind this work, is to tell old stories in new ways and to take myths apart and weave them back together for a contemporary audience. And whilst I wasn't involved as a creator of this production, I am a trustee of the company, so did have some oversight in the work. The Gentlest work was intended to be a more traditional staged performance, but is an example of a pandemic pivot. And it opened in June 2021 as a digital installation of creative responses to the myths of Orestes and his family from queer perspectives. When the company pivoted to the pandemic, they were able to invite external collaborators from the UK, USA and Hong Kong to produce over 65 fragments, which ended up being put in a digital installation. The fragments included over 30 films, 20 audio recordings, a bespoke poetry collection, and then other images and texts. This preparatory work uh, or these, these fragments were based on over three years of preparatory work for a, a more traditional production, as I said before, but because the company were experimenting with digital ways to, um, to present this work, they were able to actually share these raw fragments in an innovative way. The fragments were all installed on a Padlet platform as a labyrinthine installation. Audiences could, could explore the installation at their own pace, choosing where to roam, what to engage with, and potentially what to return to over subsequent days. Visitors were then encouraged to contribute to a response wall at the end of the experience, where they could post their own text and images in response to what they've seen. And if I can just get onto my, my next slide, there we go. No, we're playing a new video. Um, I do have a, a screen grab, there we go, of what the Padlet platform looked like. So you can see that the different paths that audiences could, could move through the experience and the different fragments that they could respond to. 
So here again, we have a theatre company using the digital for artistic innovation. And although unlike Punch Drunk, this wasn't using the digital as something that was uh, as a concept which they intended to engage with from the get go of this production, but was driven by the pandemic. Here it really enabled artistic innovation and it helped the company reach new audiences, connect to new collaborators and also further their artistic practice because they gained key learnings about embedding accessibility into a project from the very beginning and also investing in platforms which offer stability and flexibility. So although we have two very different art examples of digitally inflected adaptations of the classics, I wanted to end today by positing that the two examples perhaps represent a trend in the remixing of ancient Greek classics for the digital era. Both Cabeiroi and The Gentlest Work represent a shared interest in the idea of working in and around fragmentation. Technology has long been used in classics for the reconstruction of fragments, whether that's in looking at palimpsests or in trying to read papyrus scrolls that would unravel, that would decomp, uh, would, um, if when you unraveled them, would just dissipate and enable you not to be able to read what was written on the papyrus. When looking at examples of innovative practice with the classics, we're seeing technology meet fragments again, albeit in a very different way. Both Cabeiroi and The Gentlest Work were interested in using technology to explore the idea of the fragment. With Cabeiroi, this was in the form of taking an unknown classic and reinventing it by reconceptualizing a lost narrative that's only available to us through glimpses of a fragment. Whereas for The Gentlest Work, the company were interested in the idea of actually fragmenting a known text in order to create a defamiliarization effect. Digitally inflected examples of the classics are thus helping to expand the canon and the range of possibilities in available to contemporary artists, pushing their creative practice in new directions for new audiences, and to continue to blur the boundary between artistic output and everyday reality by inviting engagement on the streets and in our homes. And at that point, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Erin to introduce our last speaker for the day. Thank you so much, Emma. Wonderful. Um, so yes, I will introduce our final speaker, who is Kate Pullinger. Kate is Professor of Creative Writing and Digital Media at Bath Spa University, where she's also Director of the Center for Cultural and Creative Industries. Kate is the author of the Inanimate Alice Digital Fiction Series, which has won numerous creative and educational awards and about which she'll be talking to us today. In an article on the series, Kate describes how this groundbreaking multimodal project has, quote, become one of the most popular digital stories in classrooms around the world. Um, and it's as a result of the series' global outlook, its strong development of Alice's character, and its embrace of interactivity in many different guises that it's managed to evolve and grow over the past you know, 10 plus years, 15 really. Kate's the author of several other novels for both print and digital platforms, and last year won the Marjorie C. Luz Brink Career Achievement Award from the Electronic Literature Organization. She's the academic lead for Amplified Publishing, which is exploring the future of literary publishing. Um, so I'm going to thank Kate and just make sure, Kate, that, um, let's see, yes, uh, that we can see you. So thank you, Kate. And if you want to, Sorry, I think my display got mixed up. Um, I'll invite you to go ahead and start and share your screen. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, Erin. Um, hopefully, hopefully that is uh, working. Uh, let me get it into the slideshow. Is that is that working? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Great. Well, um, I've really enjoyed the series so far. Um, Deborah and I were colleagues a long time ago at De Montfort when, uh, when I was at De Montfort um, a decade ago. So it's been really nice to revisit the work of, uh, you know, such interesting work on adaptations that's, that's been going on. Um, I, uh, like Erin said, I'm going to talk about Inanimate Alice a, a little bit today. And it's a project that started in 2006 and is amazingly still, still running, which is, you know, 2006, when it comes to the digital, is really ancient history, speaking of Greek tragedies, etc. But um, so I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but currently, oops, let's go back, my, uh, my current 
one of my current research interests is um, literature in the metaverse. Um, I just wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about what I'm doing currently and this question of um, uh, is, is VR literature. And, and really what, what I mean by that is um, for the last 20 years, really, I've been thinking about what it means to put text on a screen. Um, and and uh, through a, a, a new research project that I'm involved with, which is actually led by Bristol University, Emma's University, uh, by a team of engineers at Bristol University, a project called My World. Um, I'm starting to think about what does it mean to use text in immersive media. And again, by, by I, I mean literature, I mean, but I literally mean text on the screen, words on the screen. Um, so that's a uh, current research interest. And this is just a, a little summary of uh, us. We're trying to dig away at, um, at a potential uh, research question. I hope you can see that. I'll just move that to one side. Um, so uh, I also wanted to mention The Writing Platform, which is a 10-year-old online magazine that I co-edit uh, with a team at BASPA and also our partners at Queensland, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, where we try, to, we, we try to look at where creative writing meets technology. Um, we publish academic research and we also publish uh, articles uh, for the general public and we have a small commissioning pot. So if you if you're interested in writing for us, do please do get in touch. Um, you know, we're, we're always on the lookout for reviews of, of projects as well as um, articles about, about projects as if it's something that you yourself are, are working on. Um, and then, then uh, I just also wanted to mention Ambient Literature, a two year research project that I worked on where we, we were thinking about um, we were really focusing on smartphones and the way in which your smartphone surfs away, surfs waves of data and what would it mean for storytelling to try to harness that data and bring it into, bring it into storytelling. So I wrote a, a ghost story called Breathe. That's the URL. You can, um, you can access it on your smartphone for free. It's about a 15, 20 minute read and it uses, um, it accesses every reader's um, data for on um, time, weather, and location, and then personalizes the story to every reader um, in ways that I hope are both um, subtle and uh, uncanny. So if you wanna have a look at that, please, please do. Um, but I'm here today to talk about Inanimate Alice. Um, I'm gonna go to the website, hopefully this will work. Yes, it is loading. Just let me enlarge the screen. So this is a project that, as I said, started in 2006. And of course, uh, you can't make a project about a little girl called Alice without um, directly thinking and linking to uh, Alice in Wonderland. But our adaptation of Alice is very loose. And, and indeed, uh, um, really the rabbit hole that Alice falls down is the rabbit hole of technology. Um, there are six episodes that exist currently, plus a virtual reality episode, and a whole series of what we call interstitial episodes, which are a combination of, of work that has been made for the classroom, but also work that's been made in classrooms by children. Uh, when we started working on Inanimate Alice, our understanding of interactivity was kind of limited to games. And one of the conceits of Inanimate Alice is that the story starts when Alice is eight and in each episode, she is a, a year or two older. And the games that are embedded in the stories reflect Alice's own development as a games de developer. She wants to be a games developer when she, when she grows up. So um, we, we we, we, yeah, we had this idea of moving forward step by step and increasing the interactivity. But in 2009, I had a Google alert set up for Inanimate Alice. And uh, in 2009, I came across an alert with a whole bunch of new episodes. And I knew that we weren't working on an episode ourselves at that point. So I followed the links and discovered that a teacher in the US had um, been using it in her classroom with teenagers. She, in her um, terminology were considered hard to reach and that they'd gone ahead and produced a, a big range of, of Alice stories of, of their own. And for me, that was a, 
a moment that really changed what I how I thought about interactivity and of course how I thought about participation um, and it, you know it was around the same time that Henry Jenkins started talking about participatory media and spreadable media etc et so um, one of the really interesting challenges of inanimate Alice over the last um, 16 years has been the search for business models the search to try to find ways to support this work beyond public funding. Um, and a couple of years ago, it moved from being a free resource online to behind a paywall. Um, and the producer of the project, Ian Harper, continues to, um, to find, you know, to try to find ways to expand the world of Inanimate Alice and to continue to develop it. Uh, but before I go back to my slides, I just wanted to show you our, um, our map of, of Alice, a really useful re resource uh, where, where we, it shows the centers of research as well as classrooms where it's currently featured, uh, financial support for the project, exhibitions, awards. It's won a lot of awards over the years, which is part of how it has kept going. Um, and at the moment, there's a, a, a national curriculum push in Portugal using inanimate Alice in, in the classroom. Um, so I will return to my slides. That worked. Um, and just my next few few, few slides um, are are made by Ian as he uh, as part of a a pack that he's currently working on um, for for pitching to investors. Uh, so um, this is the this is the team that is behind the project. And the, um, the virtual reality episode that was made a couple of years ago was uh, the, the lead on that was an Austra a wonderful Australian web artist called uh, Mez Breeze. Um, and uh, just a few stats here. Uh, I think this um, eight languages, the, 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 the fact that it's the text on the screen has been um, available in multiple languages for many years has uh, been a great thing for the project. And then also, uh, as you can see from the citations on Google Scholar, it continues to be a work that's, that's studied quite a lot, which has also been how we've been able to um, expand our, our research community around it. Um, and then again, this, this slide reflects Ian's, Ian's drive to figure out a business model and find a way, find a way to fund future development. Um, and I, so I wanted to bring it right back again down to, uh, to, to finish to this idea of um, text and immersive media is VR literature, what will happen with text on screens in the future in, in a world where visual media is so, so dominant. And this, these two um, screenshots are from Laurie Anderson's wonderful work, The Chalk Room. Laurie Anderson, the American um, you know, Renaissance woman who um, some of you might know as a, as a musician. But her VR work is really worth seeking out and very beautiful. But as you can see here, um, you're in, it, the, the photographs here show the, the audience in the immersive environment that with their, they're in their headset, but they're also, this is a reflection of what they're seeing and they're in a text environment. Um, and this is very common to uh, a lot of virtual reality uh, and some augmented reality experiences that I've, um, done or whatever the word is myself um, in that um, text is often there but it's always there as a backdrop it's always there as a kind of as a, a, a wallpaper almost um, and there's good reasons for that because the idea of trying to read in one of those headsets is nightmarish uh, you know the whole business of spectacles and this and the and the VR headset or indeed the tiny field of vision that you get on augmented reality uh, headsets currently. Uh, they are not reading environments. Uh, but of course, they could be, they could potentially be reading environments one day. And, and you know, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm interested in trying to think about literature and immersive, and immersive media. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Those are my contact details. Um, and uh, go over to questions if, there are any. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you to all our speakers for this great panel today. Um, as always, I've learned so much. So I'll start, we've had some questions come in um, and I'll start with one that's in the chat, if that's all right. It's one, um, it's one for you, Lucy. 
Uh, it's Claire Monk. She writes, in view of your uh, the fascinating genesis of creation's production of the time machine, can you also tell us a little bit about creatives, uh, creation's involvement in Big Telly's Zoom production of E.M. Forrester's The Machine Stops in June 2020? Uh, she says, you may be about to do so anyway. Thank you. And no, I didn't go on to talk about that. Um, because there's probably not a lot that I could say because the, so Big Telly and Creation did the co-production on The Tempest, and then we remounted our time machine at exact, pretty much exactly the same time that they did the machine stops. So we sort of both went on our own little creative journeys with very weirdly coincidental, um, completely coincidental, similar titled, but very, very different shows. Um, and obviously that machine stops prescient in a whole other um, way to the time machine and like so perfect timing for them so yeah so so they actually were sort of on top of each other so I didn't even get to go and see it because I was literally pressing buttons and operating things in zoom for the time machine during every one of their performances so I'm sorry I can't I can't fill in much in that and then we came back together to do Alice so it was like a little a little in that journey of co-productions it was one that that we weren't really involved in <laughs> oh, that's brilliant it's interesting I know that you um, collaborated a lot in the past with Big Telly, but it's interesting in all your talks about the way in which technology sort of allows collaboration in different sorts of ways. Um, and, you know, really see kind of working with longtime collaborators and maybe looking uh, to others as well. Uh, while I have you, Lucy, there's another question in the Q&A um, from a practitioner point of view. Uh, Richard Nunn asked, uh, says, he was very interested in the time machine play I'm curious how you made the backdrops look so realistic looking as I've done two digital plays in lockdown where the backdrop was nowhere near as realistic. Um, it can be a challenge. A lot of it's in the lighting. So we did we did make sure that all our performers had, had lights that they could position correctly to light their green screens well. Um, a couple of them had green screens, but for those who didn't, we sold them like, we, well, we, we Amazoned them £1.89 party tablecloths that they then sellotape to the wall behind them and that but because zoom has like um you know the inbuilt ai for the virtual background so it does facial recognition and it doesn't need a brilliant green screen if you were doing filming for green screen you would need a proper green screen and proper lighting and you know you you need another level of like detail in how well it's done but actually zoom helps you it does a lot of the work for a virtual background i think the other thing that aided it and makes them look really good is that we were using non-photographic but we weren't trying to make it look like they were you know it's, it's it's a different scenographic language virtual backgrounds if I try and put a photograph up to make it look like I'm really in this room it's always going to look a bit flat and a little bit eggy um I think is actually a really exciting like medium to explore because it means you can do more with kind of collage and, and layering and playing with that flatness and and fantasy worlds like we did like we did there and using virtual backgrounds that move and like layering them together and we now do fancy vision mixing and we can do even more extraordinary things with it but we're we're moving on to going even further with that and looking at working with visual artists and kind of returning to that that sort of you know historical precedent of sort of scenography and flats and the artistry of painted backgrounds and the idea that you know visual artists could paint backgrounds or draw backgrounds for us and then they can become our virtual sets is really exciting. Wonderful thank you and I see Richard says brilliant I shall pass that on about the lighting. I'll turn over to Deborah for the next question. Yeah I can see that Richard's got a few more questions and I'd like to follow on from um, something you just said Lucy and, and what Aaron's mentioned too, that all your projects seem to involve, sorry, I'm being selfish and asking my own question. All your projects seem to be involved in fact require collaborations with others. And I uh, just wondered what your thoughts are, all three of you, about um, whether or not it's time to rethink how we regard authorship in literary studies or in maybe for Kate, in the teaching or practice of creative writing, what's happened to our authorship? Sorry, it's a hard question. Um, yes, because, it's a question I've thought about myself quite quite a lot, as I'm sure the I'm sure the other others have. And I've I've seen a real kind of, I mean, certainly all the work I do in the digital realm is is collaborative. Uh, but as the kind of lead writer, I feel strongly that there that a, a um, an authored voice emerges from the collaboration. So that that no, that notion of um, 
of the the authored voice, uh, and uh, and I guess even in a, in a film filmic sense, the the auteur uh, comes through the collaboration. But in terms of in terms of teaching, I've really noticed that, um, especially at master's level, uh, students who want to do a master's in, in creative writing cling on to the 19th and 20th century notion of the lone artist in the garret producing the work that will then make them as rich as J.K. Rowling. That that remains <laughs> that remains a really prevalent um, way of thinking about authorship. So, so, but, but I don't think one rules out the other. And, and I think um, for me personally, they exist in, 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 my, in my person, both of those notions exist in, in, in me as well. So yeah, I hope that's useful, Deborah. It's really interesting, Kate. I wonder if Lucy or Emma have anything to add to that. Yeah, I would say it's a, it, it's a really, and it's sort of, it feels like a lot of the structures we have in place that sort of, sort of support a traditional model of authorship and the world is sort of struggling to to catch up with with what that means um and one of the examples i would give is that it's nearly i mean it's not it's bare, i've tried it's barely worth my time trying to get the rights for an established story um for a live digital production because most you know publishers and agents who are dealing with those rights can only classify it as a stage production or as a film. And as soon as you talk about digital, they start looking at distribution and they're thinking that you're making a big film and they're thinking that you, you want to make a, well, you want to make a film production of this really well-known book. Of course, we're not going to give you the rights to that. And you're going, no, it's, it's only going to exist in real time on Zoom. <laughs> it's only going to exist for the audience who, but it, there just isn't a mechanism for those kind of rights. And we, you know, we have it a lot with music as well, with, with kind of PRS and the musical rights for what we can put in a show. And then if that shows what we can do if it's live, what we can do if it's recorded, what we can do if it then has a digital archive and people want to access it in the future. And, you know, but hopefully the more all of this is adopted, a lot of those those sort of um, that side of it, the royalties side of it, and the more complicated bit will become clearer because the, the, this blurring of liveness and and recorded and the digital legacy of things is going to keep evolving. Not, I mean, that's why I wanted to mention business models when I was talking about inanimate Alice as well, because that, as as Lucy says, it, it, these things are complicated and and they're also they're also new. So so the kind of search for ways to, even just on the on the on the level of language uh what what do you call these things um remains remains problematic in regards to the productions which use greek tragedy as a source text it's the the ones that i've been talking about this idea of it being really new and people kind of feeling their way in the dark is is really pertinent um with the punch drunk piece, I found it quite interesting that they wanted to market it as Iskalis's Cabeiroi reinvented, because it was attributing a sense of original authorship to the Greek playwright, even though the three fragments that actually survived from that play were not staged in the production. One of them was used in the advertising, but it wasn't actually spoken in the play. And the narrative that Punch Drunk ended up creating was devised in collaboration with myself, but wasn't, you know, you know, it was it was our guess at maybe what the play might have originally involved, but then reconceptualized for an entirely new format. So it was it was quite interesting that they really wanted to to communicate this sense of there is an authorial voice underpinning this that we have reinvented, even though actually there may have been absolutely nothing that, that really reflected that original authorial voice in the final product. Yeah, it's really interesting, the kind of need for an author to validate the piece as a, you know, as, as a work of art. I'll pass you back to Erin now for the next question. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I have another big question for you um, from Gemma Allred in the audience. Um, she says, a very vague yet wide question, what is the future of digital in this post as we, maybe hopefully move out of the pandemic. So she asks, and I know Emma and Lucy, you both mentioned how the projects you, some of the projects you were talking about were pandemic affected. Um, Gemma asks, will digital art making continue now we are coming out of pandemic? Um, and I'll leave it, I'll leave it there open for everyone to chip in. Yes, it will. <laughs> 
I think it's like for us, it's like we've discovered the tip of the iceberg and we, we're so excited. There's so many more, you know, every project throws up a whole loads of more questions of saying, oh, what would happen if we did this? And what would happen if we did this? And so for us creatively, it's such an exciting medium to work with, but also just the access games, the people that the work can reach now that it can't reach. In a, and, and, you know, like as, as producers, so much of our time in, a, in an analog show goes into things which are nothing to do with the creative outputs, like the chairs and the height of the chairs and moving the chairs and ticketing and getting an audience in. And you know, there's a lot of a huge amount of practical logistics and money um, for us that goes in favor. And, and it always feels to me like the digital work, a greater percentage of our time is really interrogating what we're doing with our craft and what this particular story is going to be. So I don't think it's going to go away at all. I actually think it's coming into its most exciting bit because there was a, there was a period at, toward the end of the pandemic where it felt like everyone was piling into digital and it felt like a lot of that was quite disingenuous digital adoption. So organizations didn't really want to be, artists who didn't really want to be online. People who did some great work and then you talk to them now and they go, oh, I hate being on, oh, I hate Zoom and like didn't, didn't get that spark of joy from it but were sort of doing it because they couldn't do anything else. And I'm quite pleased to see those people going back to what they love <laughs> and what inspires them and it actually getting to a, a, a slightly smaller group of people who are really passionate about it and the scope for where we can all take it now I think is just just I just think it's so exciting <laughs> and I mean I would completely second what Lucy's saying that it's it's not going anywhere so the the Cabeiroy example and the oracles that I gave from Punch Trunk's work they were both from 2017 so they were pre-pandemic and they're using digital technologies in a different way they weren't um, doing, they weren't using Zoom and YouTube and, and the kind of pandemic pivots that we saw for, you know, by Jove's work and for other companies as well. Uh, and they they actually paused those digital works during the pandemic when they had to furlough their staff. So it was something to do with the the scale of the company that they then actually had to cease work. Um, so we we will see a return to digital work with Punch Drunk. They have um, a collaboration that they announced about a year ago, I believe, with Niantic who are the team behind the Pokemon Go augmented reality app. Uh, so they've got a digital project in the works with Niantic. Um, so we will definitely see more from them. And same as by Jove, actually. Uh, so although they weren't planning to work digitally originally when they started conceiving the gentlest work, they were able to harness a huge range of possibilities through working on the digital medium. And they did a range of things. So the gentlest work was the example I chose for today because I thought it was the most interesting and in that it was using Padlet in this way that I don't think other people were doing. And Padlet definitely had limitations, but it was a, a different type of use of the digital during the pandemic. They also did um, some Zoom performances um, one of which was a one woman show and then the other which was um, it involved a couple of actors and maybe a bit more with what Lucy was talking about with all the behind the scenes manipulation which I think was um, a real steep learning curve for them uh, but they've definitely found that there are an enormous number of benefits available particularly for pedagogical purposes actually for the, the Padlet project they've had a range of different schools contact them with teachers wanting to to use the production uh, and gain access to the Padlet platform and the archive of work uh, so it's something that they will be wanting to experiment with in the future not exclusively but it's definitely going to be part of their practice going forward. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I had a follow up question, but Deborah, do you did you want to come in on that one, or I can also wait for mine. No, but you can follow up. I was just gonna. I was just to follow up um, uh, with Lucy and Emma what you were saying, and but also drawing on something Kate said about the the practical challenges of finding. Kate, you talked about finding a business model that can work for new forms and this, you know pre pandemic hybrid innovative forms. Um, and I also then wondered about, you know, companies and artists who are making hybrid work during the pandemic and afterwards the challenges of sometimes finding audiences because potentially your audience and reader could be anyone in the world, but maybe kind of finding a way to present the work to, to, to create a revenue stream for it can be challenging. Um, I wondered if any of you would be willing to sort of share thoughts on that, especially for audience members who might be interested in work like this, but not really sure how to make it happen in practical terms. 
think in terms like for us we 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 sort of openly say our business model wasn't working before the pandemic <laughs> we were always if we got lucky and we we had good weather you know we didn't have snow at christmas and we didn't have rain in the summer we might cover our costs so we might make a small profit but we you know quite often we were unlucky and we'd get to the end of each year and go oh no we lost some money again and so for us, actually, we, you know, with digital, we found a lot of routes through of, of ways to make it work as a business model. There's a lot more funding available. So it's put us into an innovation bracket. So we've had Innovate UK funding. We had a, like quite a substantial amount of Innovate UK funding. We now can get local enterprise partnership funding for innovation work. Um, we, you know, we've, we've done reasonably well with bits of money from the Arts Council, again, because it takes us out of being in a pot of producers making similar work in Oxford to being a national and international, you know, producer of digital work. And um, so we find that from funding, it's opened up a lot more opportunities, but also in terms of audiences, it's, it's allowed us to do proper long tail marketing. So, you know, we're able to be, obviously we're nothing like Amazon, but we're able to be more like Amazon in that we can put on a play that's really rarely performed. So we can do the Witch of Edmonton or we can do actually the Dutch Witch of Melfi's more perform the Witch of Edmonton, but we can do this quite niche. I couldn't do the Witch of Edmonton for our Oxford audience. I wouldn't sell enough tickets. I know, I know. And the costs are higher with venues and sets and performers in digs. But we can make that as a digital show because there are enough people at a global level who want to come and see the Witch of Edmonton. And a real excitement sometimes for these really niche stories that you don't get to see very often. You know, actually people don't, it's really interesting because you would have thought people want to see the analog show and they want to see it in person. But if you're really invested in that piece of literature and you really, really want to see it performed by professional actors, it's really exciting to dial in and watch a production of it on the other side of, of the world. And we, you know, we find all the performances now have, have audience members in pretty much every every continent you know we normally we've got about 40 45 countries that that people dial in from so so i think yeah it's it's not totally a hugely commercial business model yet but it's showing a lot of potential to, to become something more sustainable thanks very much oh, i'll leave it to kate and then i'll turn over to deborah I just, just, just to add that I think finding your audience is, is always a challenge, no matter what form that you're working in, di digital or, or, or whatever. Um, so, so I would agree. I would agree with Lucy there that that it's 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 there's all kinds of um, of ways to to go about funding funding work, um, but it will remain a challenge, and and it probably all always will be a, a challenge. Um, and you know, I think that I think that it, I think we don't yet because there's such a plethora of highly high quality, very high quality visual media available to us all all uh, now. Um, I find it difficult to kind of think into the future uh, uh, in terms of what what audiences of the future will will actually want. Um, to participate in. And I think that the pandemic has had a really interesting effect in that, in, in that we've learned, we've all learned how to access work online in ways that we might not have done in the past. Uh, and so really it's the, it's the, the key, to, the key to, to understanding what we want to take from that. The key to that is understanding what we want to take from what we've learned and keep and continue to develop. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but it's also a really interesting challenge. I think. It's really fascinating, Kate. Thanks for all those answers. Yeah, it's about trying to future-proof the work that you do, and really, isn't it? I've got a question here from the Other Way Works, um, and it is: Would you say? I think this is to everyone. The complexity of the narratives and written style of the classic texts is negatively impacted by their adoption or their adapt to digital modes, uh, are there other games that might outweigh any impact? So it's a kind of classic question about um, what you what, what was taken away and what's actually gained from the work that you do. That's a great question. When it when it comes to the the Greek tragedy examples that I mentioned, I wouldn't. 
like to think of it as kind of an, a negative impact. I, I don't think of the narratives as being simplified when they get put into the digital medium um, or the, the transition from the written text into the digitally inflected production as, as losing anything, um, even though it might be put into a different form. I wouldn't want to to say it, it's it's negatively impacting. It's it's definitely different, and passages of the text might be lost in the the transit transition or the translation from the original text to the digital format. But when we think about the history of Greek literature in particular, we've got a, a really long process from which these plays were originally written to what form they survive in today. And so for um, the original Greek tragedies that we have that survive in full, what, what's written down is more often than not quite a corrupted text to use, you know, the, the actual terminology that classicists use. Uh, it's got interpolations from actors, which is where the, the version that we have have actors who've decided, oh, my monologue wasn't long enough there. So I'm going to add in a couple of lines for myself. We've got insertions that scribes have put in. Um, for some plays, we've got, um, you know, entire additional choruses that have been added and entirely different endings that have been put in by different people throughout a couple of hundred years. And there was actually a law passed in 330 BC, which is about 100 years after a lot of the plays were written that survived. Um, our, our most recent play that survives is 405 BC, so slightly under that 100 year period. But the law made official versions of these plays because there were too many changes that were happening. So the the changes that people are doing today are actually kind of continuing this legacy of reinventing these plays and adapting them and taking bits out and adding bits in. And I'd prefer to think of it as continuing that legacy. And, and maybe that's one of the positives of this. It, it's thinking about these plays as kind of living texts that are a part of uh, an evolving history of literature rather than something that's yeah, weakening it or, or having a negative influence upon a canonized original. That's great, Lucy. I'm so sorry, Emma. Lucy, do you have uh, any anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I'd say a similar thing that for us, we are, I would say our our, our analog shows, our analog ad adaptations and our digital ones are probably equally, I'm going to say disrespectful, equally ripping up the texts and putting them back together. However, you know, we feel is like creatively interesting for that particular project. So I don't think, you know, I think they're actually, they're actually surprisingly similar, I would think, in terms of how we're sort of how close to the original adaptation they are and I think we very much do see them as that that legacy of this isn't about telling the story as it is in the original text this is about creating a new a new journey through that story and new thoughts and and and, and ways to look at it and we we always love the idea that we're trying to make work where after you sit, maybe before you see it, you choose to read it, but we certainly have the idea that you maybe go away afterwards go, I don't need to read that. <laughs> or I don't remember that bit, or that was interesting. And that it's also about a reconnection with, with the original too, that they'll, they'll see the adaptation. And we love the idea that you then might go and, and reconnect with the original piece of literature too. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it's been an old kind of old chestnut in adaptation studies about fidelity and, you know, why, why you know why have fidelity why you know you want to do something new and you don't want to just copy or you know transcribe but Kate have you got anything to add to uh, to yeah, what I, just said yeah just just to say that I guess um the, the works that I've been engaged with uh, the fundamental difference between them and and what Emmy Emma and Lucy are discussing is that um the works that I've been talking about are reading experiences they're they're not viewing experiences. They are viewing experiences because they use they use a, a big range of digital media to aug augment the, the and t and in, in fact to tell the story, but at the same time they are fundamentally reading experiences. So um, I might not have made that clear in my presentation. Is that uh, when I talk about text on the screen, I'm talking about reading on, on the screen and what and what that. Um, what it means to put words on a screen intermixed with other with other media, and and is there um, are readers of the future going to be interested in text on a screen, 
in an age where visual media is so rich and so so accessible and and um, so um, such a marvel, really. Uh, so yeah, just to just to return that to that kind of fundamental difference. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. And I pass back to Aaron. Really interesting. Thanks very much. Well, the next question is from Cassie Martin, and it's for Emma. Um, and it's also thinking about, I think, sensory experience. Um, uh, she says that she was intrigued by the experience of using headsets and then removing them and how that changed immersion in a theatrical event. She asks, was there a notice noticeable difference for the audience or participants? She says, I'm thinking about the sensory focus and deprivation and then re-immersion into the real world that that would have helped facilitate. And then she says, thank you in advance. Ah, thanks. Um, Re-immersion is a, a great term to use for that experience, I would say. So the, the three parts of the performance, I would argue, serve to gradually re-immerse the audience participant in the real world rather than in the performance. But of course, the real world is, is this collapsed version of reality where it's augmented by the performance that Punch Drunk are putting on. So you're exactly right. In the first instance for that audio experience, you have the sensory deprivation, which helps even though you're on the streets of London and you're exposed to whatever the weather is that day and whoever's walking past you, you're listening to something that's pre-recorded and you're being explicitly maneuvered through particular streets onto a particular path. You can't get lost um, because you're constantly being guided by this voice and it would require a kind of willful opposition to depart from what you're being told to do. When the, the headset is removed, you are taken out of that world. So it's the kind of opposite experience of what we talk about often when we talk about immersive theatre of kind of falling down the rabbit hole and emerging in an alternate reality. So you do become much more aware of your surroundings again and you feel like maybe you're back to reality a little bit but of course there's still performers around you even though you might not necessarily know who they are and you're kind of struck by that sense of the uncanny because things are occurring and you don't quite know whether that's the real world or that's the, the performance world that you're in. And in the final third, although you're invited into much more of a traditional immersive theatrical performance, it doesn't happen instantaneously. And the, the final third was signaled by you being separated from your, your partner that you attended the show with. And you had to continue that kind of scavenger hunt journey for a little bit by yourself before you taken to a particular venue and you undergo a kind of initiation experience. So the, the increasing isolation of the individual and integration of them within their surroundings makes that final initiation ritual much more real than it would otherwise feel, I would say. So it's, yeah, a kind of re-immersion, but re-immersion into a particular version of reality rather than actual reality, if that makes sense. Might be a slightly convoluted answer, but I hope it helps. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. And I, it makes me think about the way that certain kinds of technologies and especially creative experimentation with them can help us kind of pay attention to different kinds of sensory information in new ways. And especially with work that is crossing between digital and physical environments, how it can maybe resensitize us to the sound of a street or something like that. And I wondered, Kate and Lucy, if that's something that has informed any of your creative work? Uh, yeah, we, we've, we've sort of um, uh, explored, explored that in different ways as well. So we did a, a production um, in 2022, which was an audio piece um, written by Angus Imri. And what we did with it was a piece about grief and we sort of read the script and when it kind of feels like you want to be able to create a listening experience with it. So what we did in the end is we had an illustrator do a set of postcards that go with the, the audio piece, um, but they're black and white postcards and the invitation to the audience is that you listen to the piece of audio work and while you're listening to it, you colour in the postcards. So it's almost like a mindfulness activity, but partly coming from my own kind of sort of, you know, very aware of with digital engagement, that the biggest challenge you have is actually audience focus because people can do, you can't tell, well, we do tell them to turn the phones off, but you, you can't actually, you know, 
stare at them if they leave it on. So, you know, you, you are distracted from people simultaneously trying to check an email or looking at a phone or answering a question from someone else in the house. So, so we, we were interested with that auditory experience of actually kind of looking at what can we give people to do to really, really give the space um, to listen to the piece of work. And I think it's a really, we did a, a similar thing. We did a Christmas show that went alongside a dining experience. So you were sent a the box of food and in the box the little packages and you unwrap the little packages and each box had a sort of artifact that went with the piece of footage that you were watching and that you're sort of interacting with so I think there's a there's a really lovely world of work you can do that is in using the digital and more kind of sensory personal things in the space as well. Uh, I mentioned in my slides a, a work a more recent work of mine called Breathe, which is a, a work for the smartphone. And um, part of the, my kind of impetus behind that project was a kind of reaction against geolocative work, locative work that requires you to be out on the streets with your phone. So uh, the, in reference to, to, to punch drive, because um, I, I felt that there was that there are too, often too many assumptions made there about the audience and how comfortable people are on the street, streets of a city interacting with a work of art on their phone, especially if it requires you to wear head, noise cancelling headphones. Uh, I know loads of people who for many different reasons is, would not feel comfortable doing that on the streets of a city. Um, so the piece was made in kind of direct conversation with that really in that it was a, a work of locative fiction that asked you to, to read it in your bedroom alone at night. So it used locations around where you were uh, without requiring you to, to leave your room or indeed be out on the street. And so that, that was part of what I was trying to kind of play with in, in, that, in, in that work. Um, so I think, yeah, I just, I wanted to, to, uh, to yeah, I think that, well, I know I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's great. Thank you so much. I, um, came out, I was about to come up with a big opinion, but I'll. <laughs> well, feel free. You can tuck it into the chat as well. If you I, want. Won't I, be, gonna... I won't be offended, Kate. <laughs> no, don't, no, don't worry, Emma. Yeah. But it's also really helpful to think about, you know, um, I suppose it's obvious, but to, to underline that, that there are different, very different kinds of digitally hybrid art making, and there are lots of different audiences that might come to them. Um, and so thank you all for reflecting on that point. And I noticed that someone in the chat shared another piece that they, uh, they find interesting. If other audience members want to share links to their work or things that they found interesting that relate to this conversation, please do so. I'll pass over to Deborah now. Yeah, that would be really helpful to share any, any resources that you've got. And um, I've got a question here from Benjamin um, Broadrib. Broad and. Uh, he says a two-part question for all three panelists. We have a two-part question. Um, what are the benefits and drawbacks of using existing technologies such as Zoom and Padlet for adapting text for digital performance? And is the future of digital performance in the development of custom-built digital, digital performance spaces or in the further utilization of the technologies already available? There's lots going on in that question. So, um, the, 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 whoever's great can answer first. It's very difficult. Very good question, Benjamin. Thank I'm you. happy to have a go, having done both things. Um, right. So, so we've done a lot of our productions in Zoom, um, which is is really brilliant because it's got the it's so widely adopted, uh, you know, worldwide, and millions of pounds are going into its development. So it gets better and better every day. And the main thing that Zoom can achieve which is brilliant for us is that because it's a, an, an app, it has all clever things that sort of deal with latency and make it usable for all kinds of people with terrible bandwidth at home. Um, the downside of it for us has been that it is very associated with work and it is very associated with conferencing and academia and, and, and also has developed a kind of pandemic stigma about sort of Zoom activities and Zoom lessons and Zoom classes. And we've all spent too much time on Zoom and so many articles written about everyone's pleased to be on Zoom. So there's a slight stigma attached to it. We've also, so our Innovate funding I talked about was to build our own platform. So we built our own bespoke platform um, for digital theatre, which is called Auditorium, um, where we were able to say, this is what we want a digital platform to look like, and we love it. 
Um, but it's really challenging because it's we're we're a, we're a tiny theatre company in Oxfordshire and we've tried to build a, a platform and um, and in many ways it delivers exactly what we want it to. On the other hand, I can't get it to work on Safari. We don't think we'll ever get it working on Safari. Never try and develop anything for Safari. Um, you know, and, and actually people with really bad bandwidth without because it's a web-based application without going too technical, because the web-based application, you need huge capacity to develop an application that would work and deal with bandwidth of, of such varying things. So it works well for most people, but we now, if we're streaming a show in auditorium, we have to simultaneously have a backup Zoom call open and anyone that can't access auditorium, we throw into Zoom. The hope is that that will change, you know, that with time as technology develops, as we all get better, you know, if things, 5G, the, the wider adoption of 5G, the wider adoption of better bandwidth, we're hopeful that it will eventually just catch up to the point where our platform and what we've developed and actually making bespoke environments will be much easier to achieve and those technical things will be, you know, and every day the ability to access really good information online about how to get around technical problems, get, you know, it's a very generous community, the tech community, there's always a forum with an answer to any question you've got. So I think we're hopeful that the trajectory of how accessible that will become is going to increase, but certainly in the short term, like we, we can't survive without those pre-made platforms that have got lots of development capacity. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I think as a follow up, Lucy, I mean, you talked about kind of technology evolving all the time, every time you turn on Zoom, it's got better. Um, do you think that risks the shelf life of the kind of work that you do, that um, it could be better, you know, I mean, I'm sure it couldn't be, but the idea that, you know, if you did it, you know, now, what you did, you know, two or three years ago, it would be so much different, so much better experience. Oh yeah, it yeah, the, the shows uh, you know, and we will we ourselves we talk about the Tempest was like held hailed as this, you know, it was a fantastic show. I sometimes think if we did that now, mm -hmm. everyone would go, Oh, it's a bit shonky. Why why does everyone like it so much? And it, you know, it was sort of charming in the green screens not quite working, and it was so fun. But you know, like it's it's we can just we can't just remount the show we did two years ago now because the technology moves on so fast that you can remake. But also that the technology is always giving new possibilities. So as theatre makers, you never want to stick with the, the thing you're looking at, you know, that you've just done because yeah. you've seen the new possibilities and the new direction that you want to move in. Yeah, the performance is in the moment for you. I, I mean, someone like Kate, you know, when you want something to be more permanent, um, you might have different thoughts about this. So I'll, I'll pass on to Kate and then maybe Emma could come in. Yeah, no, that was, you're right, Deborah. it was making me think about obsolescence and how, and how um, this, this affects, affects digital works so over and over and over again. Uh, and one of the impetuses behind Inanimate Alice going behind the paywall as it's done is that the original software that it was built using, which is Flash, uh, became obsolete. And it would, you know, it was clear it was, it was going to stop working on all browsers and nothing could be done about that. So the episodes all had to be rebuilt and future-proofed. Uh, and so that was the point at which it went behind a, pay, a paywall. So I, you know, but I, as Lucy says there, you know, there are countless um, ways for things to break when you're working in the digital sphere. <laughs> and that, but that also, I think that, um, that shonkiness can reflect the way in which Quite a lot of work that we do in this realm is actually kind of handmade in a, in a, in, a, in quite a profound uh, way. Even if we're talking about code, handwritten code, adapted code, adapted softwares, adapted platforms, etc. And so I think that that kind of that goes with the territory. And um, you know what we're trying to do is more about um, you know none none of us are coming from the big corporate corporate angle. We're we're, we're coming from a kind of more human-centered, artist-led uh, angle on, on work of this, of this kind. Thanks, that's really interesting. Emma, do you want to chip in here? I think sure. Kind of so the, the two companies that I talked about were obviously working at very, very different scales. Um, so I think the answers are quite distinct for the two companies. For By Jove, there were definitely some advantages to using Padlet. It was, for a company that were pivoting to a digital format quite quickly, it was relatively user-friendly, uh, relatively low cost, 
uh, and it was able to do what they wanted, which was to produce this digital installation. Uh, but it certainly um, had some usability limitations. And going forward, I think the company would be looking, or I know the company would be looking at a different type of platform. That's not necessarily one that they would do bespoke, but having the benefit of more more of a lead time, I think would be, um, would see them research other options rather than necessarily go with the, the market leader of digital installation platforms. Uh, for Punch Drunk, they um, have, I suppose, it, it's always um, relative, isn't it, but more budget and more collaborators. And so they're definitely going down the path of creating a bespoke platform for their work. And I, I didn't mention this when in, introducing Kiberoi, but it was it was an R&D exercise. So it it did have tickets available for a paying audience, but it was marketed as an experiment for the company. Um, and it was really a, a first um, toe dipping in the water into a, a new way of working. And the learnings from that were always intended to then be um, generators for new content for the company. Uh, and that included thinking about actual what actually what platforms they would want to create if they were going to go down the digital route in the future. Uh, so they're, they're much more looking to, to create bespoke offerings, uh, but to do so with collaborators like Niantic rather than just of their own accord. That's, that's been really fascinating. Thank, thank you all three of you for those great answers. I'll pass you back to Erin now. Wonderful. Yes, well, we're, we're basically out of time, um, but I've really enjoyed this discussion. I'm really grateful to our panel, uh, to Deborah, to everyone for being here, um, and to the audience for all of your questions and comments and some really interesting comments and examples of hybrid work and adapted work have been coming up in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to finish by quickly plugging um, our next event, which is that cross-professional workshop I mentioned on the 15th of July, which will be hybrid. Um, it will be in person in Birmingham at a big city center historic venue called The Exchange, which is dedicated to public engagement and knowledge exchange, but it will also be streamed online. So for people who are interested in these questions, uh, but who are further afield, feel free uh, to sign up that way. I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, we'll be hearing from Sarah Ellis, who's the Director of Digital Development at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and she's a, a producer on the Audience of the Future project. The RSC, with their collaborators, created an adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream called Dream. It'll also feature roundtables with creative practitioners and teachers, some of whom were in the audience today. Um, and if you are within the UK, we have travel bursaries available, so uh, you might have a look into that. Here's the link. Um, finally, when this Zoom call shuts, there's a really short survey just asking about how, how this works as a platform for people, because part of our project is also thinking about different ways to network, to exchange ideas um, during, but also after the pandemic. So any feedback from the audience members would be really appreciated. Um, I'll finish there, and I just want to thank everyone once again, um, and especially our speakers for really fascinating talks. I'll give you some you know, physical applause. I'm sure there's lots of digital applause going on as well. <laughs>